Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 269, The Heat Chaser. Read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, it might take more than hubris to survive. Fifty-eight point five degrees, Nicholas Cartier muttered in frustration, and put the handheld digital thermometer back in its cooling bag before the thing overheated. He knew there was no point in setting up the air temperature recording rig and its satellite uplink. It was not going to get hot enough to surpass the new record. 61.5 degrees Celsius, captured by his rival Soren Ramos in Elefsina, Greece, a month ago. Sure, it had been a unique set of circumstances. An intensely stubborn local heat dome, lack of wind and the light stone blocks of the ancient Greek ruins concentrating the heat. But the measurement had been done correctly, and the record was official. He took his gloves and sunglasses off to wipe the stinging sweat from his eyes, squinting as he looked around. Then, on a whim, Nicholas took a deep breath of lung-scorching air and immediately coughed it out. He was standing in an abandoned town square in the center of a small valley, ringed by eroded red rock slopes which held the heat in, making it an ideal location. Even the weather models had looked promising, predicting the formation of a heat dome, and one had in fact formed, just not as strong as predicted, and that was the problem, Nicholas thought. Even with the best satellite ground temperature data and weather prediction models his money could buy, finding the right place and time was, more frequently than he'd like to admit, a matter of luck. Suddenly, his radio crackled to life, drawing him out of his funk. Nick, are you there? It's almost time to leave. Your suit AC has only 30 minutes of power left. Over. Amelia, the lead of his support team, warned. She was sometimes a bit too cautious for his liking but then he was still alive while many others weren't. I'm turning around now. There's no chance of a record here today, he admitted reluctantly, then stood for another minute taking in the sun-baked landscape, which in its own way he found beautiful. Like this once vibrant village in Xinjiang Autonomous Region of Western China, the hottest locations in the world had been abandoned, letting nature slowly heal the wounds of human activity. Only a few more decades and all traces of the place would be gone. It was a harsh reality, but Nicholas knew some life, mostly subterranean insects and rodents, would manage to adapt and thrive in the newly reclaimed land. Just not humans. The old modified land cruiser climbed up the trail out of the Turpin Depression, passing a row of abandoned buildings, threatening to break down in the heat. Nicholas, sitting in the front passenger seat, downed a liter of water and watched the new desert landscape roll by. The Chinese government had officially closed the region almost a decade ago, so it hadn't been easy to get permission to heat chase in the area, which only made his failure to record a new record all the more frustrating. Three degrees off, he complained, wiping his mouth with a sleeve. This was a wasted trip. We should have followed Soren. Where was he today? Not in the field, Amelia admitted distractedly, dodging a crack in the heat-stressed road. So. Why are we out here? Nicholas complained. What does he know that we obviously don't? Who's doing his scouting? Maybe I should hire them instead. Amelia rolled her eyes. It wasn't a complete loss. We got a wet bulb reading of 38.3 degrees. That's 1.2 over the old record. People die at 35 and 100% humidity, she added. No one cares, Nicholas dismissed. Wet bulb is too technical to understand. Humidity evaporation and all that. The hottest air temp is direct and simple. It's the gold standard everyone gets and we haven't bagged a new record in months. He glanced accusingly at Amelia and the rest of the support team. I pay you to find the most promising sights, he groused. On Ramos's live stream the other day, he claimed he'd capture another record, somewhere in the northern hemisphere, 62 degrees before the end of August. Find me something like that. Don't waste my time with places like this. He gestured at the landscape rolling by outside the land cruiser. Wet bulb record? Who cares? 
he snarled and punched the dashboard with a gloved fist. I want to be back on top, no matter what it takes. I enjoy the challenge, Nicholas explained to the audience, but there's also something addictive about knowing you're standing in a place that is, at that moment, unique. There is also the thrill of surviving the hottest place on the planet and knowing you are the first person to do it. Nicholas had made his fortune in the tech industry and didn't need the money from speaking engagements, but he loved the attention and affirmation of his importance so he did them any time the opportunity was presented. It's a bit like being a storm chaser, he continued, but much more physically demanding and dangerous. A storm chaser gets close to a tornado, but tries to stay in front of it. A heat chaser intentionally puts themselves at the very heart of the inferno, so you put your life on the line every time you go out. We work at the very edge of human tolerance, so an equipment failure or miscalculation will cost you your life. Like the Furnace Creek Death Valley incident a few years back where a poorly maintained off-road adventure tour bus broke down in 55 degrees Celsius heat, stranding 15 tourists who were expecting to only dodge out of an air-conditioned cab for two minutes to take a selfie of themselves, standing beside the big thermometer at the weather station. Even at those temperatures, if you are not properly equipped, it doesn't take long to die from heat stroke. The air temp may have only been 55, but I can assure you that the ground would have been 10 degrees hotter. When someone finally came looking for the bus, well, you all know the rest. Nicholas liked using the story to dramatize the dangers involved. Although heat domes don't move like supercells, he explained, it's still vitally important to understand weather patterns and use satellite data to help predict the time and place, which these days could be anywhere in the world. So pursuing the hottest recorded air temperature is an expensive and deadly game. There's only a few of us with the resources, knowledge, and guts to do it, and we are highly competitive. In the past, potential locations were predictable. They'd be in Death Valley or the Lut Desert or the Flaming Mountains in western China. By the way, my crew and I were near there in the Turpin Depression just a few days ago. No new air record, but we measured the highest wet bulb temperature to date. All you used to have to do was watch the surface temperature in those areas using satellite data and look for an iconic slow-moving high-pressure system, then hop a plane or private jet to get there first. But these days, who knows where the next record might be measured? Mongolia, Siberia, or even the Great Plains of North America? It's a moving target, which shifts as the climate changes and constantly goes up. That's part of the appeal of heat chasing. There is never truly a winner, just a leader based on the last temperature they've measured. And you haven't been on top for quite a while. You should talk about that, someone yelled from the back of the tightly packed hall. Nicholas shaded his eyes to cut the glare of the stage lights, and anger raced through him when he saw who had interrupted his talk. Soren Ramos, he growled in disgust as heads turned to follow the disruptive man down the center aisle to the stage. Mr. Cartier there hasn't recorded the highest air temp in almost two years, despite spending millions, Ramos laughed. On the other hand, I've managed to hold the lead for most of that time, and that's without having the use of a private weather service, a full-time support team, and a fleet of private jets to get me around. He boasted standing in front of the stage to ensure the audience focused on him. If you know what you're doing, you don't need to be a billionaire to be a heat chaser. Nicholas was aware that his face was turning red, and he was about to ask for security to remove Ramos, when he made a snap decision. I have a bet for Mr. Ramos. He's been lucky, but luck does not last forever. Nicholas waited for the sporadic chatter in the audience to subside before continuing. Whoever records a confirmed air temperature of over 62 degrees first, wins, and the loser will agree to quit heat chasing. The words were out of his mouth before he had considered the ramifications, however. The crowd applauded, and Nicholas couldn't take the bet back. They sat in the support vehicle looking through the rippling heat across a dry river valley, eroded deep into the arid plains, while Nicholas got his gear organized. At one time the road had traversed the valley, but once the area had been abandoned and the road left to fend for itself, the occasional torrential thunderstorm had washed away the thin, hard top to the point that it was no longer possible to drive any further. 
more like a gorge at this location. The precipitous depression had been cut down into layered sandstone after the last ice age, as if the plains had been sliced apart by a giant knife. A snake-like channel, at its center, still marked on the maps as the Milk River, had gone from year-around glacier-fed, to seasonal runoff, to bone-dry, then to geologic fossil. It wasn't where any of them had expected the next record temperature to occur, just north of the U.S.-Montana border, but the conditions were perfect. The steep walls made of light-colored eroded sandstone reflected the sun's energy into the valley floor. The exposed river rock lining the bottom of the old channel boiled it back into the air where a local heat dome, stronger than anything Nicholas's team had seen before, held it in place. There's someone on the other side of the valley. Looks like they came in from the south, Amelia noted, looking through a pair of custom-made range-finding binoculars. I've got them at four clicks from the target. That makes them at least 1,500 meters closer than we are, she advised, wiping sweat from her forehead, despite the van's AC working overtime to keep the interior tolerable. Let me see, Nicholas demanded, and stopped struggling into his custom-designed heat gear created for him by the same contractor that made EVA suits for the space industry. He grabbed the binoculars from Amelia before she had time to take the strap off, almost strangling her. No, 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 he raged. It's Ramos. I can see his sponsor's logo on their truck. When did they arrive? Nicholas swung the binoculars around wildly, looking for his nemesis. I think I can see him making his way into the valley, he announced angrily. I'll never catch up from here. Get me closer, he demanded. Amelia hesitated. Get me closer or you're fired, Nicholas threatened. The road down's mostly gone. I don't know if we can get back up. Amelia protested. Before she could stop him, Nicholas reached over and put the van into drive, causing it to roll over the lip. The machine slewed sideways on the loose scree, grasping for purchase with its nickel-titanium metal mesh tires. Amelia whipped the steering wheel in the opposite direction to gain control, and the van bounced down to the valley floor before coming to an abrupt halt in ruts left by some past expedition from wetter times. That wasn't too bad. We made it down in one piece, he glared at Amelia. Now, I'd appreciate it if you drive me to the edge of the old river, Nicholas insisted, and began again to get into his protective gear. Ramos is only halfway down the south bank, so if I leave now, I'll be ahead of him. We'll never get this thing out of the valley, Amelia protested, checking the outside temperature. It's already over 59 out there. The van's only rated for 57. We can't stay here. I don't have time for your whining, Nicholas complained angrily, pulling on protective gloves so he wouldn't burn his hands on the ground or the metal of the van as he got out. It won't take Ramos long to get to the valley floor. I don't understand how they got to that side. I thought you said that the whole area had been closed, he accused. They shouldn't even be there, Amelia said defensively as she experimentally stepped on the accelerator. The van lurched forward and started trundling toward the riverbank across the rough, broken ground. I was told the south side of the valley all the way down to the border was not accessible, she added. The government would only give us a permit for an approach from the north. Unless they simply drove across the border, then overland to here, you should have thought of that. That would mean they're here illegally, Amelia pointed out angrily. As if that makes any difference, Nicholas dismissed. They'll put him in jail for a day, then deport him. So what? The van suddenly jerked to a stop. The terrain ahead was too chopped up to go any further. Not far enough, Nicholas cursed. Now I'll need to jog to beat him. I can't take all this extra gear. Get it off, he demanded. Nicholas waited impatiently as one of the support crew unbuckled his pack with the extra water and the extra cooling plant. He rudely pushed the man aside, then scrambled out through the side door letting in a flood of searing air. The moment his feet touched the ground, he realized he had forgotten to change into his custom-made boots and could feel the heat reaching up through his light hikers. Making a rash choice, he decided that as long as he didn't stop in one place too long, his feet wouldn't get burnt. Besides, the heavy boots would only slow him down. He looked around to get his bearings, then headed off at a jog toward a bend in the dry riverbed where the ground's heat would be concentrated like the center of a walk. You're crazy, Nick, 
Amelia protested over the radio. You left your backup gear here. If you had done your job right, I wouldn't be in a foot race to the target, Nicholas complained angrily. Consider yourself fired. Nicholas charged recklessly forward at a brisk jog, knowing that he would soon overwhelm the network of fine coolant-filled tubing that covered the inner layer of his heat suit. He kept going anyway, anxiously glancing south to check Ramos's progress down the steep slope, and tripped over a rock, twisting his ankle. Damn it, he cursed. Are you okay? Amelia's scratchy voice called over the radio. I thought I fired you, Nicholas shot back. He had fired her before, but there wasn't a huge pool of people willing to be part of a heat chaser's support crew, so they both knew he would change his mind once the dust had settled on the current expedition. Look, I figure we can sit here for an hour max before the batteries start overheating, then we're going to have to try and find a way out of the valley, so you've got sixty minutes to get back. No, you're going to stay where you are, Nicholas commanded as the radio crackled off. That's all I need, he cursed. His crew wimping out just when he was on the verge of success was inexcusable. This time he would follow through and get rid of them and find people who would willingly take the risks needed to win. He stumbled again when pain shot through his ankle. We're going, he informed it stubbornly. Even if you're fractured. Nicholas picked up the pace, grimacing with each step. By the time he got down into the riverbed proper, he was sweating inside his suit and his ankle was throbbing. He took a short break, shifting his weight from foot to foot, so they wouldn't burn or the soles of his hikers start to melt. It really had been a stupid idea, he realized, not to take the time to put on the proper boots. The sun was just past its zenith, beating straight into the bone-dry riverbed. The rounded white stones which littered the bottom like bones reflected the heat back up, causing the air ahead of him to ripple like water. Nicholas pulled his handheld digital thermometer from its cooling pouch and held it out, shading it with his body from the direct sun. It flashed 61 degrees before overheating. It was a good sign, already only half a degree from the record, and it wasn't even the hottest part of the day or the best location in the riverbed. His feet began to burn, so he started off again, sweat now pouring down his forehead into his eyes. Although he had been in temperatures close to this in the past, it seemed like today was somehow ten degrees warmer plus his ankle was complaining almost more than he could bear. He stopped again to chance a quick look down to see how much it was swelling. That's when he noticed what looked like quickly evaporating wet spots on the ground behind him. A tear in the heat suit near his injured ankle, caused by the rock he had tripped over, was leaking coolant. It was why he had been feeling the heat more than usual. Nicholas cursed, pulled an emergency patch from a pocket and slapped it over the gash, hoping it would adhere in the heat. He had lost too much coolant and knew he should turn around, but it was only a few hundred meters to the target, and Ramos was close behind. Nicholas pulled out the umbrella he used to shade his air temperature recorder. Holding it in one hand to block the sun, he hobbled on. It didn't feel much cooler, but it was all he could do. For the first time, he imagined the heat as a demon hunting him, trying to kill him. His radio crackled. Nick. I hope you are at the target. There are only 38 minutes left before we have to move. There was static, then silence. They'll just have to wait, he muttered to himself, and squinted at his GPS through stinging, sweat-soaked eyes. The useless thing was dead, a victim of the aggressive heat. How much extra had he paid for it to guarantee it would operate in extreme temperatures? He'd go after the manufacturer when he got back, embarrassing them online to tank their stock value. At least he had memorized the terrain from satellite images. Squinting, he thought he could see the target about 200 meters ahead. A bowl in the river bend carved out in some long-ago spring flood when the nearby mountains still had snow and glaciers. He stumbled forward, eyes burning, trying to focus on the goal, determined to get there before Ramos. Just another hundred meters or so, he encouraged himself. How long had it been since Amelia had radioed? He didn't know and sipped lukewarm water from the spigot that poked out of the collar of his suit. Somehow, the target area still seemed impossibly far away. The sharp, staccato clatter of tumbling rocks abruptly broke the heavy silence of the superheated still air. The sound came from somewhere behind, echoing through the rugged terrain. Who's there? he yelled, 
stopping briefly so he could hear over his heavy breathing. There was no answer. Panicked, Nicholas discarded everything he could, keeping only the gear he needed for the measurement, and began to run. He knew it was a mistake, but he refused to be beaten again. He reinforced his determination by imagining the expression on Ramos's face when the man arrived and realized he had lost. Vision limited by the caustic sweat streaming down his forehead into his eyes, Nicholas was struggling to maintain his balance by the time he had stumbled down into the bowl. It might have only been a degree or two hotter, but to Nicholas, it felt like he had just entered a broiler. He had heard more rocks tumbling as he made his way there, before realizing that Ramos had followed the edge of the old dry river channel instead of walking through it. Up there, it might have been two or three degrees cooler, but the banks around the bowl were steep and would take time to climb down, which gave Nicholas an advantage, although he was paying for the prolonged exposure to the superheated riverbed. Knowing he didn't have much time, Nicholas didn't bother hobbling to the exact center of the bowl. Instead, he moved a few steps toward the north side where the rocks would be hottest and began to set up. He instinctively sucked at the spigot mounted to his collar before remembering he had left the water back where he first heard the rocks falling to lighten his load. Dropping his measuring gear on the ground, he began to set up the tripod for the recorder. To properly measure the air temperature, the device had to be 1.2 meters above the ground and in shade. One of the tripod legs, metal swollen in the heat, refused to telescope out. His gloved hands couldn't get a strong enough grip on the leg. Nicholas tore one glove off and grabbed the pole with his bare hand, pulling and screaming as the hot metal burnt his skin. Finally, it reluctantly extended. Ignoring the pain, he stuffed his throbbing hand back into its glove, attached the umbrella to the tripod, and angled it to shade the recorder. Without the umbrella, the sun's rays began burning through his headgear, and he knew he only had a few minutes before he'd pass out. Nicholas clicked the satellite transmitter in place last and turned the recorder on. It flickered for a second, threatening to shut down, before displaying 63 degrees. I've done it, he laughed triumphantly, but that's when he noticed the transmitter's status indicators were red. The thing had overheated. All that expensive new tech and it fails at the critical moment. Nicholas spun around to find Ramos standing a few meters away laughing at him looking like a Freeman Desert warrior from Dune in his loose-fitting sand-color heat suit. He had somehow snuck up while Nicholas was struggling with his gear and had set up his own. Ha! That's why it takes more than money! Ramos laughed again and switched on the transmitter on his old beat-up rig and gloated for a second before realizing his had failed too. Nicholas laughed and shouted, Bet you don't have the guts to do what's needed! He grinned defiantly, then disconnected his suit's cooling unit. Blue fluid started to spill out of the hose onto the ground and boil away. He directed the flow over the transmitter in a desperate attempt to cool the machine. You're crazy, Ramos yelled frantically. You'll never make it back without your heat suit working. Nicholas watched the precious coolant spill over the transmitter. Just as the final drops evaporated off its sun-baked surface, the transmitter sprang back to life and confirmed it had sent the data. I don't care, I just won, he smiled then collapsed like a rag doll onto the searing ground. Hey everyone, this is where we recommend new podcasts we think you'd love. This time it's called Looters, and it's a really funny, action-packed, sci-fi western show. It's an actual play podcast, which means that it's all improvised storytelling that uses dice rolls to throw a wrench into the characters' plans every now and then. They just launched on July 18th, 2023. So this is a great time to jump into the story. New episodes are released every Tuesday, so go check them out at looterspodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You can help us continue creating original content twice a month by either heading over to ko-fi.com slash makeshiftstories and making a one-time donation, 
or becoming an ongoing supporter at patreon.com slash makeshift stories. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written and read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.